Yep. Uh, so let's get started uh, since we are tight on time. Uh, people would continue to filter in. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Mohsin Ahmed. Uh, I'm a senior systems engineer at Ford Motor Company. I'm Manu Pasari, senior systems engineer working along with Mohsin at Ford Motor Company. So I delivered the presentation here last year as well. Uh, and this slide and the content is a repeat from last time just to provide a quick uh, recap for everyone. Uh, so early last year, Ford Motor Company announced its transformation plan with the creation of Ford Smart Mobility LLC subsidiary to expand from an automotive into both an auto and a mobility company. This strategy has allowed Ford to stay focused on strengthening and investing in its core business of manufacturing cars, trucks, and utilities, and at the same time enabled us to uh, pursue, aggressively pursue emerging opportunities through Ford Smart Mobility to transform the customer experience to a new dimension, which is core to our strategy. Next, uh, this is a high-level uh, Ford's One IT strategy, uh, which has a futuristic theme. IT's main areas of focus are run and protect the business, improve IT capacity, agility and efficiency, and continuously innovate to improve the business. So we embarked on the Cloud Foundry journey about two years ago uh, with the development of a mobile application titled Ford Pass. The launch of Ford Pass was part of Ford Smart Mobility Initiative and the beginnings of, beginning of Ford's transformation into an auto and a mobility company. Ford Pass is the experience platform deployed on PCF to deliver, deliver mobility products and services to a broader base of mobility users that provides both in-vehicle and remote features and capabilities. After the launch of Ford Pass last year, there was a significant increase in the interest by the application teams to test and consume the microservices architecture. We continue to onboard additional applications on the platform by expanding its footprint in public cloud and our enterprise data centers. Besides expanding the platform, a lot of focus was placed on improving the governance for the platform and implementing a robust tool set to secure, automate, and fine tune the infrastructure. The main theme of today's presentation will be around how we expanded the PCF platform and the efforts involved during the last year in improving its governance. The six main areas are architecture, security, availability, scalability, automation, and maintenance. I'll briefly touch on each of these areas as we will get into their respective details in a moment. So on the architecture side, two years ago, we started PCF's implementation in Azure and completed the architecture for on-prem last year. We expanded the number of Cloud Foundry foundations and improved certain areas to extend the integration with internal and external services. On the security side, a lot of focus was on placed on implementing a tool set. Uh, we deployed Vault and on-prem GitHub Enterprise and expanded the use of certificate authority based root sign SSL certificates. On the availability end, we improved the backup and DR capabilities to introduce better OLAs. For scalability, we enhanced logging and alerting to monitor resource consumption and streamline the scaling of resources. On the automation end, we deployed concourse for managing the platform. And for maintenance, as you know, it's a high maintenance platform, which requires continuous and rapid iteration with various updates. We enhanced the use of concourse to create new pipelines for various use cases. So next, we'll get into each of these governance areas and cover them in more detail. We'll start off with the review of architecture for Azure and on-prem, followed by the rest of the key areas of governance. Uh, this is the high-level current snapshot of our on-prem and Azure deployments. Uh, we initially started in Azure and then applied the lessons learned to our on-prem impl implementation and applied some improvements along the way. We, we tried to keep both the implementations aligned as closely as possible However, as you can see, there are some differences between on-prem and Azure architecture due to the availability of feature set and components at the time of implementation, and differences in network and storage tiers. We implemented the OpStack model at on-prem and plan to roll it out in Azure in the next few months. Now moving to the individual architectures for Azure and on-prem. This is a high-level architecture in Azure, deployment with active-active topology across two regions. As you can see, we are leveraging services in our enterprise data centers where it made sense and deployed components in the public cloud 
where it had the technical and business justification. PCF foundations deployed across multiple regions utilize global traffic manager and regional load balancers. Some applications are utilizing API manager as well to be their client API front end. As you can see on the slide towards the left, we are consuming on-prem infrastructure services, which include GitHub Enterprise, directory services for single sign-on, logging uses syslog and develop dashboard in Splunk for monitoring and alerting. Towards the lower end center of the screen, the diagram illustrates platform being integrated with Vault and Concourse, with some applications using SQL database for persistent storage, along with events hub for handling event-based messaging. Next, Manu will cover the details for our on-prem architecture and will delve into the com commonalities and un uniqueness of the PCF platform in Azure and on-prem by touching on the areas of architecture, security, scalability, and availability. So, Manu. Thank you, Mohsen. So, now that we've actually looked at all the different implementations that we have done across Azure and on-prem and uh, how we actually implemented so many different foundries. I'd like to kind of like take us down to a single foundry and how we implemented in our environment. So this is kind of like a typical implementation of any cloud foundry in most of your data centers. So maybe most of you guys might be thinking, why am I seeing this all over again? So the key things that I'm actually, uh, I want to point out here is, you see that uh, the top level edge firewall, and then from there you see the load balancing systems combined together in the SLB, and then the HA proxy layer, and then the NAT gateway and firewall systems. And the reason why I touch these points are, these are the ones that are actually, that were the most pain points for us, which we actually solved uh, using different mechanisms uh, throughout our uh, implementation phases. So uh, what this gave us is different uh, points of control points for us to make sure that the ingress traffic is a known traffic and also we had a control point on the ingress traffic as well with the NAT gateway or the firewall device that we had. Another point that I want to touch on this slide is the HA proxies that we deployed in our foundries is an open source HA proxy which actually provides the functionality to offload SSL to support uh, uh, custom URLs for applications running on this foundry. Uh, and also we have uh, implemented some ACLs uh, at the HA proxy level to make sure that we are not exposing all the administrative endpoints for these foundries to external uh, networks uh, that are trying to access these foundries. So now that we actually reviewed, uh, oh, actually one more, one more thing that I want to touch on this is uh, the dotted line that you see there is uh, an RFC 1918 address space is where we actually deployed these foundries. And that is one of the reasons why we see, or you see a NAT slash firewall system at the perimeter of the uh, uh, foundry. So going on to, or taking us down to one layer down, on how is our infrastructure laid out across OpStack that we've been talking about or, and at the foundry level. OpStack is, de is actually deployed in a management vSphere cluster which is actually leveraging or using storage that is actually replicated across the data center. So in case of a single data center failure, I still have my management infrastructure up and running so that I can continue maintaining and managing my other rest of the foundries that are in, running in the other data center. So now going down to the actual foundries itself, as you see there, they're actually deployed across two different vSphere clusters, that are, and each of the vSphere cluster is spanning across two different racks. So that actually gives me a resiliency of, uh, even if a full rack goes down, my foundry is still up and running, and even if a full cluster goes down, my, still, my, my foundry is still up and running. So that way we introduced multiple layers of resiliency both at the Cloud Foundry level as well as at the vSphere or the infrastructure level in our implementations. And uh, now going in, now that we've talked about architecture designs and how we implemented the different foundries and all across Azure and on-prem, I'd like to kind of like take us through what are the differences and commonalities across Azure and on-prem implementations at the current state of uh, our current day. So the commonality is we've been deploying Cloud Foundries across multiple regions in the Azure space, multiple data centers in our on-prem implementations. The, dif the, the differences are the tool sets that we used to actually deploy all these foundries. So in, in, in our on-prem environment, we've been using a, a full stack, app stack that we've been calling, which is a combination which will combination of different components, which we'll get to in the next few slides. So what we try to bring in using those uh, 
app stack components is the, the fully automated deployment of not just the app stack, which is the management stack, it also kind of like helps us to automate, fully automate the Cloud Foundry implementation as well. So on the um, Azure side, we've been leveraging Jump Server and uh, uh, to deploy our foundries. Uh, one other thing that I would like to touch on this is, uh, uh, pro I mean, AppStack is deployed using Protobosh, and Protobosh gives us the capabilities to, uh, Protobosh manages or monitors the AppStack components, and in case if an AppStack component fails, it actually will resurrect that component in case of a, a failure. So I actually have res uh, resiliency at that layer as well. So moving on to uh, what is AppStack and how did we deploy this? When I say fully automated stack, what did we do? So the only virtual machine or the component that we deployed manually is using a template, Bosch in a template, and from there on, every other component that we deployed in the AppStack as well as in individual foundries is all automated and automated using uh, 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 concourse pipelines. And we also leveraged a couple of tools that are part of the bastion there that you see, Genesis and Spruce, which actually gave us the capabilities to split our long uh, deployment manifest files into like smaller components and smaller pro properties that we can use and maintain and manage and understand them so that we can actually, uh, it's much easier to deploy. It, it's much easier to actually uh, uh, kind of like remove the credentials and the certificates out of the manifest files and put them into something like a, a secrets management tool like Vault that we've been leveraging in, the, in our space. So now, now that we looked at what's op stack, let's look at how did we actually bring in security, which is part of one of the governance pillars uh, uh, that we were, we, we were working on all this year. So the commonalities are we've been leveraging Vault for uh, secrets management, and uh, our credential management and uh, certificates management. AD federation across all the foundries to maintain uh, access controls to apps manager. GitHub for version control as well as for authentication for Concourse uh, itself. And uh, SSL certificates uh, across the foundry using HAProxy SNI support. And extensive logging and monitoring and logging into an external system as well as we actually push those logs into an SIEM system that is sitting outside of the foundry. So now that uh, we talked about the commonalities, quickly touching on the, uh, the differences. From an on-prem point of view, we implemented ASGs. Uh, even though ASGs bring in some basic security functionality today, uh, we are actually expecting the future releases of ASGs to bring in much more robust implementation process as well as logging capabilities within ASGs. And also, uh, as you have seen, we are actually we have implemented uh, perimeter firewalls both at the ingress and egress point of view in our data centers. And also in Azure space, we are leveraging uh, network security groups, which are Azure network security groups, to actually implement uh, our control, access ingress and outbound access into our foundries. So the next slide actually, a very high level, um, automated implementation of ASGs. Uh, uh, basically the way we implement ASGs in our environment is once the application teams gives us the ports and protocols or access control list that they need to be implemented at their space level, we as one of our engineers reviews them, they, 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 work, they put them into GitHub. Once that is approved, they, actually, they are actually pushed through using concourse pipelines. And then that is actually in place in production. We're actually working on another pipeline which actually is to validate what we've implemented versus what's approved. So that way we can reconcile them on a regular basis. And this kind of like uh, leads, it in, leads us into our next future project that we've been working on, which is actually to auto onboard the users onto the foundry, which includes creating the orgs and then uh, uh, onboarding the user onto the foundries. So if we automate the ASG implementation as well, that kind of like merges both the worlds together wherein they get the access to the foundry as well as they get the necessary security policies in place so that they can right away start developing their code without engaging yet another security group to open those firewall holes. So now that we talked about uh, ASG workflow at a very high level, let's talk about availability. How did we bring in availability into our foundry implementations? 
We actually, like we've been talking about, we've, we've implemented foundries across multiple data centers and multiple regions. And we also have Jumpfire replication across multiple uh, foundry implementations. We have extensive logging and monitoring and also alerting in place that actually alerts or sends alerts of anything that happens to uh, our operations team which to act for them to act on a regular basis. And then the differences are uh, the, in the tooling that we've used to back up the data, the metadata that is critical for the foundry to be resurrected. So we've leveraged something called Shield, which actually backs up uh, CCDB, Blob Store, or Bosch Blob, Bosch DB, and other a few other components to for us that gives us the capabilities for us to resurrect and bring the foundry up to a state where the application teams can start deploying their applications in a short window of time. From an Azure point of view, uh, we've, we've actually been running some custom scripts and uh, which actually back up all those components that I just mentioned. Uh, and the jump box where the custom scripts are run is actually backed up using uh, uh, Azure recovery services. So now that we talked about availability, let's touch on how do we scale and how do we keep this, uh, I mean, uh, 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 keep up keep up on a regular basis. So we actually generate uh, regular weekly and monthly uh, capacity management or capacity reports. And uh, we proactively monitor all the Diego cell capacity so that we make sure that we are ahead of our customer consumption of Diego cells. Uh, teams are working uh, currently to actually do the same capacity reporting for uh, service instances also. So once that is in place, we're planning to roll it into uh, production. Uh, so today we actually have uh, Diego cell scale up and scale down automated through concourse pipelines. So I mean, to keep us ahead of the, ahead of the demand that we are seeing, we actually leverage pipelines to scale up and scale down con concourse pipelines. So now now that I talked about the all the different few of the governance items and also a little bit of uh, architecture on on prem foundry, I'd like to hand it over to Mohsen to talk about automation. All right. Thanks, Manu. So on the automation, and as you mentioned, we implemented the concourse pipelines uh, along with Genesis. Uh, so as you know, deploying code or updates uh, across multiple environments uh, can be a challenging task, especially when it comes to ensuring that there are commonalities like IIS properties and networking are common and when they are, they, when, where they are common and where they should be specialized. An ideal deployment pipeline is where you are implementing tested code in sandbox, performing your integration and acceptance testing in pre-pod, and then moving the code to production. Uh, we encountered significant challenges when we needed to make changes to the common elements of these different environment, environments and observed that without proper discipline, these different environments can easily dip, drift, leading to negative consequences. To address these challenges, we introduced Genesis, Proofs, and Concourse in our environment. So, just to give a level set of, uh, to everyone what Genesis is, Genesis basically changes the scenario of making changes to the common elements of these different environments by breaking up the Bosch configuration manifest along three logical strata, global site and environment. At the top, the most generic configuration is considered global. Uh, this is a general outline of the deployment, uh, what jobs on which instances is specified here and used everywhere. Beneath that, the site stratum defines the composition and co configuration of the infrastructure. And at the lowest level environment, it provides the place to set the networking for a single deployment and specify the override properties and scaling factors. Genesis combines these different levels of configuration to produce a single manifest, bo single Bosch manifest for each environment and uses another tool called Spruce to handle overrides and references in a straightforward and a predictable manner. At this point, we can leverage concourse to consume the manifest produced by Genesis. So this is the architecture how we implemented Concourse, a pretty standard way of deployment. Uh, a single implementation of a web front end uh, with a back end database and a cluster of workers across all the foundations. Concourse is integrated, integrated with GitHub and Vault and we are using GitHub as a back end OAuth for Vault and GitHub, for Vault and Concourse. Now let's review how Genesis and Concourse play together. Our infrastructure can be considered as code. Each PCF deployment uses a YAML file exceeding 5,000 lines of code to deploy. 
By using Genesis, we are taking our 5,000 plus lines of manifest and turning it into an object-oriented YAML design. We split up our code into smaller, more manageable files and reduce duplication by using references instead of duplicating lines of YAML. Some of these references pull multiple certificates from Vault, further reducing the size of manifest we need to work with. We achieve this by taking properties that apply to all foundations and put them at the global level. Properties that apply to the foundations in the same region are stored in the site level, and properties that apply to a specific foundation are stored in the environment level. All these are merged with Genesis upon build time to create one manifest that we deploy with. Once these manifests are organized using Genesis, we can use Genesis to create concourse deployment pipelines for us. PCF and all services are then deployed using this pipeline that Genesis creates. This is just a high level layout of our concourse CF pipeline. Uh, next, this is the end-to-end -end concourse workflow that uh, we already talked about, uh, starting from an admin checking in their manifest to GitHub that uh, triggers the alert at the concourse level, and then the concourse worker doing the heavy lifting of using Spruce to do the merge and pulling the secrets from the, the vault, and then deploying using Bosch to either Elastic Runtime or PCF services. So next, uh, Manu is going to get into our day two operations and how our operations team is managing the platform on a day-to-day -day basis. So Manu. Thank you, Vasil. All right, so now that we talked about all the automation that we built in, all the different architectures, how, how is our operations team managing this on a regular basis? So what we have a daily stand-up call uh, in our environment. So Every day, pretty much, the operations team looks at efficiencies around how, what are the different things that we can automate today. That's the mindset that we start with. So, so far, they've been able to, like you have seen, they uh, automate the deployment, upgrade, scaling, reporting on a regular basis uh, to our management. We also are in the process of uh, bringing automation around, like I mentioned briefly early on, on how do we actually automate the process of onboarding a user without an ops team getting engaged in the onboarding process. So that's being actually coded and tested in the lab environments. Pretty soon we hope we can roll that into our production environments. And also briefly touched on this other next line item as well. We actually have uh, pipelines being built to actually uh, reconcile the ASG rules that we have documented in GitHub versus what's being running. So that way, we have a good understanding and a clear picture of why a particular application is working versus not working. So that's the operational activity. And coming to the maintenance activity uh, uh, of the foundries, we actually created a true DevOps model in our environment where engineering team and operations team work hand in hand. We, we basically sit in the same room working hand in hand. We created a very efficient and nimble environment where we iterate through, we discuss through what are the different versions needed, the compatibilities and things like that so that we can actually keep upgrading and fixing the code or fixing the systems to facilitate our application team's onboarding process, the application uh, code itself. There were some, some instances where we had to work with the application teams to actually fix their, help fix their code. So that's the kind of environment that we, uh, we, we work in. We actually extensively leverage uh, uh, concourse pipelines like we, we saw in our uh, earlier slides. Uh, we actually perform platform upgrades during normal business hours. That's the most important thing that I'd like to stress on here. Um, now moving on to, now that we talked about operational activity, the maintenance of it, let's look at what are the challenges and lessons learned uh, by our team over the last uh, year to two, two years per, uh, period of time. So we actually ran into, for specifically from an on-prem point of view, we ran into the license limit at the LTM level by running only one, performance uh, running of only one application with eight microservices running within the foundry. So what we did is we worked with our partners, brought in this custom or open source HA proxy, which actually brings in the SNI support and the custom URL uh, support to alleviate that problem. And we also have the capabilities to scale up, scale down HA proxies because it's Bosch deployed and Bosch managed. And when we were deploying this, uh, uh, the, 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 the latest foundries in our data centers, we also deployed 
a NAT device which ended up being a firewall device, which you never want to do that because now you actually have to work with your firewall team to document the ports and protocols of every application team that's being onboarded. So that's one of the overhead that we introduced into the process. So every application team has to go through this laborious process, which we would want to eliminate in future if, if, if at all possible. And then in order for us to give a true active-active sense from an application point of view, we actually had to introduce something called GSLB sticky configuration. To continue maintaining the user session to a given Cloud Foundry for about 20 minutes time for, to avoid him going through the loop of authentication loop if he was bounced back and forth across the foundries. So that's one of the things that we want to avoid. And we also implemented Shield, which again, uh, it, it is a temporary uh, shortfall, most likely, which is uh, it doesn't back up Vault today, which has all the secrets that we need, and it doesn't encrypt the data that, is, uh, that it is backing up today. And we're hoping those uh, will be fixed in future releases. And now I'd like to hand it over to uh, Mohsen to talk about challenges on Azure Space. All right, thanks, Manu. Uh, so some of the, the lessons learned of the challenges in the Azure Space, uh, we found out that the network, uh, network address space has to be uni unique across all your foundations. Uh, that just makes the, the logging and the integration of tool set uh, much easier. Uh, there's a limitation of mounting external storage in Azure uh, to one terabyte. Uh, but I think with the recent announcement from Microsoft uh, for managed disks, uh, we will be evaluating that feature in near, near future. Uh, another thing, uh, we don't have the ability to create custom roles to, to delegate uh, granular uh, permission set to our developers. Uh, and on the concourse pipelines, we've seen uh, th they aren't fully portable. Uh, there's still uh, manual work required for deploying Cloud Foundry uh, from one environment to another. And on the logging side, uh, we've, we ran into issues where any time a developer turns on verbose logging, uh, and especially since we are using Splunk in the back end, it has exceeded our threshold for the licensing. So that does uh, create an issue on the, the, the logging. Uh, now what's next? Uh, so the, some of the items uh, we plan to focus on is to draw more alignment across our Azure and on-prem architectures. Uh, and the tool set. Do frequent uh, credential rotations, uh, definitely logging and monitoring enhancements. Uh, we like to evaluate some of the Azure service brokers uh, around event hubs and Cosmos uh, database. Uh, we like to introduce a self-service uh, developer portal where they can, developers can go in and create their own orgs. And there's another initiative in uh, works right now for the software development uh, developed ecosystem where we would like uh, to just not automate the CF, but the uh, tool set as well, including Jenkins and some of the other things. So before we open up for QA, I'd just like to recognize uh, one of our team members, Tim Deichelborg. Uh, he couldn't make it uh, to the conference. Uh, he's part of our PCF Ops team. He helped us putting this deck together. And I see uh, Chris Gullian and his team. Uh, they've been very helpful uh, along the way. Uh, Post-implementation uh, in uh, automating our Cloud Foundry through Concourse and implementing that tool set. So with that, uh, I open the floor for Q&A. Uh, so, so when you when you talk about running workloads on-prem and in Azure, so do you have the ability to run you know, both simultaneously, like a true hybrid? I mean, do you, Go there no, we, we are not running in a hybrid mode. Those, those are two independent implementations, yes. Uh, On-prem and Azure, uh, it's, it's not a hybrid cloud. No. So do you, do you do anything through load balancing or do you just keep purely separate? Yeah, so the way, the way, we, the way we've implemented the load balancing is uh, active-active in both on-prem and in Azure. So it's uh, active-active implementation in Azure uh, in two regions. Same thing, multiple data centers uh, in on-prem. Uh, and but, also to add to that, uh, the applications that we're running in Azure and on-prem, they're focused to those environments. So things that are uh, mobile ready and uh, customer facing, which actually needs uh, uh, proximity to the customer are running in Azure space, whereas all the corporate uh, stuff is running in, the, uh, in our data centers. So, so most of our connected vehicle stuff, you know, uh, applications that need uh, geographical proximity to the vehicles, is in Azure, and mo most of the marketing and sales types of application are on-prem. Is the data in the same place, so the data stays with whether they're in Azure, or, or did you say it was actually connecting back to on-prem? 
part of it is in Azure, uh, but we are bringing back all the logging data. Uh, especially with our deployment in China, there are some uh, regulatory constraints also to keep the data in those specific regions. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. All right. Uh, Thank I you. We're out of time. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for attending. <laughs>